I don't suppose you still want it. <laughs> okay, so, some of the intermediate cartoon. We already know that we need to be asking ourselves, how are we going to do the strongest impression? How are we going to engage the audience? What is the visual simile that we can use? What do we want them to feel? What do we want the flashes to go by and for their brain to mix it together? Oh, it's a body, but it's an arrow. What's happening? Right? We already know that. How are we going to go to the intermediate zone, though? Okay? Let's, um... Um, this is, I'm going to be the best doctor. Movie. <coughs> Tell me? All right. Nightmare for Christmas. Okay. Combining multiple impressions. That's the first way that you can take your cartoony animation to the next level. Okay? The best way to do this is to actually use the context of the scene as well. It's actually super advanced cartoony. The fact that they used a lasso underneath the roadway. Because it's actually three things. It's not only just a super fast moving impression, it also has to do with Southwest, because they're running around in between the mesas and the, the desert. But it's also what the coyote should use to catch that stupid thing that's right, right, right in front of them, right? So it's, it's, it's actually three things. It's so multi layered, it's, it's beautiful. And so as you're going through, getting to intermediate cartoony is not just like, oh, I like new cartoony, but I can't do like really good stuff. Right? I'm not like advanced yet. It's not really that. By the way, that's my impression of me being stupid, not any of you being stupid. <laughs> that's how I saw. Um, getting to intermediate cartoony means just not being satisfied with any of your impressions that you you've come up with until you've come up with the right one. So you can actually jump if you've never done a cartoon animation shot correctly before, and I imagine many of you right now are thinking like, oh man, I've just been pushing all the time. But, which is okay. But you can jump immediately into intermediate cartoon if you just think long enough. Um, any animation mentor uh, guys here? Hey okay. guys. What's up? <clears throat> you guys know that there is a huge emphasis on avoiding cliché. And that goes doubly for when you're trying to establish a style. Because if you're, the thing is with style is that your answers have to be the same for all the questions that you're asking yourself as you're working. For instance, you know, how, how impactful is this going to be? You're not going to have one action be less impactful or engaging than another. You know? Pixar dialed it, dialed it way down at it. Um, XAMRE goes wild with everything. So it has to be the same. But um, avoiding cliche um, will help you get to intermediate cartooning because you'll be like, okay, am I going to have him, you know, you know, scald his butt and he shoots up in the air? Okay, well I've seen that a million times. Wow, what else can I do? You know, you might come up with something, you know, uh, a little bit better. Maybe if you're animating Willy Wonka scalding his butt, he'll melt like candy on the sidewalk. Or if you're um, I don't know if you're animating a, uh, if you're animating like a uh, a fox, he'll like <laughs> like molt all his fur because it's like going instantly from winter to summer or something. <laughs> Using visual similes that contrast with the scene, another way to jump super like way into it. So the Roadrunner, the the last aspect of the Roadrunner um, lasso is is this. Because that lasso is the tool that would entrap the roadrunner. So don't stop thinking about those visual similes until you get to one like this, okay? Layering your animation using textual cues and straight up variation. Textual cues are things like um, broad gestures matched with small or micro gestures, uh, very you know slow, long arcs matched with um, quick. Uh, quick actions, okay? So you have the, the big and the small, the fast and the slow, um, and using those, using the visual impressions that are going, going to give you the textual cues, rather than having to just like, again, go through your scene and say like, oh, well, these gestures are all looking the same, I'm gonna make this one smaller and this one bigger. Hey, look, it's very right. And breaking tradition, um, I already touched on this. It's just uh, um, has to do with 
just looking for new ways to engage your audience. So the scene that I came up with, I wanted a guy um, leading my podium from my desk, and a spider comes out, and he notices the spider. <laughs> notices the spider. <laughs> And he freaks out and runs as fast as he can in the other direction. Now, how would that look realistic? <clears throat> Do it. Ha! Variety! Oh, okay. It's okay. People at home, I'm going to edit that out. <clears throat> I'm also going to edit in a laugh track. <laughs> hey, do I need a little bit more, though, than that? <laughs> okay, so, oh god, can you imagine how boring it would be if I just pushed the little performance that I just did? Right? Bipedal, you know, average weight, <clears throat> and, uh, oh no, and then running, you know. Footfall. My feet are hitting the ground. It's, it's the friction between my feet and the ground that's propelling me forward. Oh, so boring. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to bore you to death. So I began like you should always begin. Okay? So here's our shot. Man sees spider. Man is scared. Man is at screen right. Remember the difference between the realistic and the impressionistic approach. What impressions can I get? All right. So the first one I gave, what, that I wanted to give, was that he was like almost knocked up by his surprise. That was the first one. I definitely wanted that. So very little anticipation. Right? You don't want him to go. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, I um. Uh, I, I had a personal story about spiders. <laughs> I recently bought a house, and underneath the house, there's some wiring that's bad, and I've been going underneath there lately, and I tell you, I know what hell it looks like, you can ask me. <laughs> it's underneath the house, in California. <clears throat> there's a black and stuff. Okay, so first thing I want is I wanted to really like, just like pop into the air, right? So, two frames max anticipation on that. Second thing I wanted was I, I said, all right, how can I make him get out of there as fast as possible? What would give the strongest impression of him poking, right? So I started going through all these impressions that I that I've seen before. That's the problem. I started with the very like, kind of like you know small ideas and small thinking. Uh, first one that I thought of was he could do a zip out. Uh, zip out is is basically what they you know. When the character in, in one or two frames max would blur out of screen and normally leave like a little puff of smoke behind. And um, that actually served two purposes. One, it was a very cartoony way to show someone getting the hell out of it. But uh, number two, it actually was, it saved on animation because you could use it zip out over and over and over again. Um, and it was you know, a lot less animation, a lot less body animation. Uh, so it was actually dual purpose. But um, so, okay, so we have, we have that, and I, was, I wasn't too excited about that. Like, zip out is just not exciting. What can I do? So the next thing I thought was, how about if he pops up in the air, and he never touches the ground? Because he is so freaked out that he can decide, like, when he's ready to return to, to the ground. But then, I mean, that's going to be too... It's not going to be visually clear. It's going to be too confusing because it's going to mix a couple of different impressions that don't mix well together. And they should. They should mix very well together. So then I thought, okay, clear my head. What would be the absolute worst nightmare of somebody that's trying to move this way from a spider over here? Being unable to do so, how? Falls. Paralyzes. Paralyzes is good, but that's not much animation. 
Okay, slipping on a substance on the floor. How about if his feet are slipping in such a way that we get the impression that there's a treadmill pushing him back towards this, this spider? Right? So he's running. He's running, and it's not like he's like slipping on like water or goo or anything like that, because nothing on the ground. It's like there's an invisible treadmill, like a conveyor belt of death, bringing him to spider. <laughs> so I'm like, that's what I'll do. And then I needed a way to get him out. And what I thought was, that's where I'm going to bring in the feet are not on the ground. So after he face plants on this invisible treadmill, he's going to pop up and then he's going to do a rubber band uh, exit from screen. He's going to use his legs to wind it up, and then he's going to rubber band up. <clears throat> okay? Sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. So let's start where we always start. We always start with video reference, acting out, thumbnails, and inner monologue as a timely tool. Um, the last one I'll tell you about in a sec. It's one of the most underused things, and a lot of people feel like it's cheating. It's not cheating, it's amazing. Um, and I'll tell you that in a second. Video reference. Video reference for cartoony shots, what would the, what, would, what would should I be looking for for the cartoony shot? I should be looking for the impressions that I want to give. I should be looking for, you know, you know, cartoony interpretations of it. I need to look for the actual real thing. When you're animating a cartoony shot, you're animating the real thing in the body of the character, with good fundamentals, with, 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 with good everything. Nothing's broken or pushed, so if you wanted to animate, like, you know, body is like lasso. Uh, I'm not here. <laughs> uh, then you would you refer to lasso video reference, right? So I need to gather some video reference, um, and so uh, this is what I get. Um, first thing was the um, running on a treadmill, and this was very fun to research. <laughs> if you're of the faint of heart, you might want to look away. So anyway, I got a lot of video reference for the treadmills. And the, the best part about watching this was that almost exactly what I wanted to have happen, um, happen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Plus, I think. Um, so you'll see. See, look at his hands. 
<laughs> See how his hands are, are, are back behind? <laughs> all right. The next thing I wanted, when I started looking at all this video reference, I said, like, you know, what? I really want the impact when it comes off the ground to not look like a body. I want to get just something a little bit stronger. And so what I I thought of was sausage. Like when you throw a sausage down, it, it, it bounces, and there's a little bit of like boom, boom, boom. So anyway, I just got a couple couple sausages. <laughs> That's not relevant. This is. This is relevant. Check this out. Like rhythm and 
and cadence you can feel. You can actually feel it when it sounds. And um, I think it's our, it's our, the best way that we can express the feeling that we get from visuals is by directing by sound effects alone. But um, then I recorded this for myself. Uh, here it is. And, um, and then I took the sound, the sound file from it. And then here's where you can first see where my performance, where the performance that I, uh, that I looked for. Uh, was here, and how I was piecing all these things together. Freaking out, running on a treadmill, falling like a sausage, bouncing up like a, uh, like a sausage again, and then um, winding up like a rubber band and shooting out. Okay? So I'll turn the sound on. See how I'm using, I'm punctuating every single action with sound. Okay. I took the second one. I took the second performance as my sound. And um, you'll see that in a little, just a second. And then um, here are just some thumbs that I drew. And um, this is basically the place where you first get to see the staging of the show. So he's leaned up against the podium, freaks out when he sees the spider, up in the air, still up in the air, anticipating coming down. He's about to land right here. Takes a step and then has a couple of treadmill steps, leaves the ground, splats, and then gets that kind of like sausage -y kind of feel as he comes up, and then winds up his feet, and then the back catches up to the front and pulls him up. Okay? So I had this at the ready. I always work all the time with everything at the ready. You know, with my directory, right here, of all my video reference, um, with my thumbnails, either, sometimes I print them out, and I just keep them by my uh, computer. Um, everything, always, at the ready. Okay? Still recording? Oh, girl. Oh, we got plenty of time. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So then, inner monologue is time to work. So, my inner monologue, was the sound, sound file. And I use this actually with pantomime a lot. And it's actually what I use to um, teach pantomime uh, to my students, which is you want to come up with a kind of like an inner monologue that the character is saying to themselves. Okay, that is saying to themselves as they're, they're moving. It's really hard. Like, okay, the action is going to be they're going to um, hear the phone ring and then they're going to pick up the phone, put it to the ear, and then get that news. Right? All right, so how do you time it out? It's really, really hard. You do a lot of experimenting. You have a lot of like pushing, you know, your poses. You know, all your uh, controls key on the same frame. You do a lot of pushing and pull. Why not just do this? Actually, get a microphone out. Record yourself like speaking the inner monologue as that action is happening. So phone rings, um, answering it, and uh, it's bad news. And you want to try to punctuate almost everything you can would sound as well. Okay? So, inhale, exhale. What? Hmm. Well, I'll answer. And hit. And answer. What? What? <gasps> okay. So that was the super dramatic, right? Very melodramatic. And you can improve the performance. As, as much as you, uh, as much time as you have. Good art is never finished, it's just released, right? So, but what the, the point is, is that then you have a sound file you can slug right into Maya or something like whatever you're using, and you have like, it's almost like you have dialogue that has completely timed out your animation for you. And you're like, this is fantastic, right? 
Um, and with cartooning, it's fun because you kind of have a little bit of a sound effects track because I'll like and everything, and, and, and actually, you'll see it actually turns out pretty fun. So then, I go into layout. And in layout, you are worrying about, first and foremost, staging, composition, and story. Okay? How are we going to get this action to happen on screen? And, you know, I trip over this stupid thing. <laughs> I'm trying to look organized and I'm failing. All right. You're trying to show the, the show the action and staging just doesn't mean you know camera position. It means what poses are you going to use that um, or, you know the silhouette is clearly going to tell the story and um, and such. And if you really pay attention to those first three things, um, you're in good shape because you do have the sound effects track for your timing. Um, Sometimes, if I'm really afraid that I'm not going to be able to get that, that thumbnail that I drew that I really want in the scene, I might load the thumbnail as an image point on my camera. Um, just sometimes. Um, keep your video reference handy. I said that. Keep that folder open. And then I block, or I lay out in step keys, and I'm always checking my poses against my thumbnails. Okay? So let's um, switch over now. My do your work. Or don't be stupid. <laughs> For those of you who uh, came in here late and didn't see that yet, um, I'm not kidding you. Everyone laughed when I said this. I'm not kidding you. You will do like five to ten percent more work during the day if you have that as your, your background. You'll see it. You'll get embarrassed. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna play Angry Birds, but now. <laughs> okay. So let's start. With layout, I actually don't need to see this. Okay. So here we have our scene. There's the spider dropping. That's it, right? 120 frames, five seconds. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load my rig. I'm going to reference my rig so if there's rig changes, I can um, propagate into all my shots. Um, hopefully you guys are working with uh, reference rigs. And here's a rig. Guy's called Groggy. He's available on uh, Big Crash. I love him. Let's see the way I put him. Da da da. That was exciting. All right, so first thing you want to do is definitely you want to do a little bit of rig testing if you aren't familiar with the character um, already. I already knew that he has a pretty nice uh, stretchy spine. It uh, doesn't gimbal, but it does um, candy wrapper, which is when you get past you know a certain certain point that uh, goes like that, which is okay. We're not going to push it to that much extremes. Um, I was at first upset that he didn't have stretchy legs. But then I was very happy because it kind of meant that I was going to need to be uh, extra uh, careful about my posing to make sure that it sort of worked in space, worked in, in my in my stage. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load up that sound file that I just created. Oops. And I'm going to navigate here. It is. Frame one. And uh, and just listen. You can tell already how easy it's going to be to time this. Okay. So um, I'll just dive right into it. So let me just uh, show you how quickly you can just start setting poses and get your character um, into shape. And I can actually answer questions as I work. So if anyone has any questions at this point? How exactly did you import your track into the? Um, I went to Window Animation Editor's Track Editor. There's a you can actually go file import audio, but um, I like to do it in the Track Editor because um, your sound needs to start on frame one. So Track Editor is already open, and you can just slide it to frame one right there. So that's how you use the audio. Sorry. You can change the timing of the audio. Right, you can change the timing of the audio. Track Editor is very robust. Um, uh, good question, though. And if you have a question, you can just call it out. 
So that's how you're able to actually move your audio over and, and like you need your audio to start 10 frames in rather than like one. You don't have to cut 10 frames out of the audio. No, yeah, no, you don't. Actually, this is my 2012, um, which is dope. Uh, if you go into the camera sequencer, you can actually add um, multiple um, audio tracks, and they actually mix together. Um, cool. I'm not sure if that was in 2011. It's been a while since I used it. Good question. I kept his arms FK because I knew that there was going to be very little logic interaction. Um, you normally want to keep everything um, that is not going to interact with an object um, FK, and his legs are IK because they are definitely going to interact. For sure. What, what website did you say you got there? CreativeCrash.com. CreativeCrash is the new name of high-end3d.com. Um, and uh, now it has like this complex login system, and, and the, the resources are actually like, kind of hidden. It's not that great, um, but it has the biggest uh, uh, library of character rates that are free to download um, on the internet that I know. Anyone know of any, any bigger ones than Creative Rush? Uh Animation Buffet, I think, has a lot. Animation, animation Buffet? buffet. Yeah. Okay. So we got a lot, a lot. That's like a club. Okay. All right, so those are two others that you have, uh, have access to. So I'm just setting up his pose, and really all I'm all I'm looking for is to keep everything, you know, kind of just uh, kind of simple. And another trick that I, I will use that you will see me use is I will make the character kind of um, um, I, I will pose like everything on the same frame. Um, and right, I haven't set any keys yet, so it doesn't matter. Auto keys or I definitely work with auto keys. How about character sets? Do you, do you use any character sets for some example? I don't really like character sets because I kind of like the idea that I have to be aware of everything that I'm keying. Um, other people swear by them, though. That, I, I wouldn't say that that's like a hard and fast rule. I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay, so we have this. You know, just starting, relax pose, and, and whatever. Um, you notice I use this heavily, which is basically your selection mask. Um, normally what I'll do is I'll just go all off and then select curves. Some rigs actually don't have all the controls or nerves curves. They look like it, but it's actually a box that's been templated or, or something like that. So you gotta be careful because you can leave a lot of controls behind if you don't test it. But I tested this one and all the controls occur, so I'm gonna work. I also don't want to be messing really with my facial controls right now, so I'm going to turn them off. And you pretty much want to set everything that you don't want to key where it's going to be um, at the end so that you don't end up setting you know, a million keys on something that you don't really want to. So anyway, now with my post set, I'm going to go to frame one, hit set for my key, and then make sure, I should have done this first actually, that uh, I'm in step mode right now. All right, so out was uh, spline just now. So I'm going to save that. What, um, where is the default like uh, tangents that you work with? You work with spline? I, I, I work with spline when I'm splining. I work, I, I, I lay out everything in step mode. Uh -huh. And because step mode um, is, you know, no BS, black and white, exactly where your pose changes, um, which is great. Um, my 2012 has um, auto tangent now. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this yet. But this is the default tangent type now, which is auto tangent, which is not as, uh, it's still not as dope as Michael Comet's auto tangent. Um, is it Michael Comet? Yeah, Comet's yeah. 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 okay. yeah. It's not quite as, as good, but it's okay. Um, so um, actually, um, I probably will switch over to start using auto tangent when I splined from now on. All right, so this is how a, this is how good this sound file is going to Come in handy already, so let's just sit here. Okay, so right there is where he um, gets freaked out. So let's just key that. I'm only going to do one more pose in front of you so that uh, you don't fall asleep. But again, just yell out questions if you have any. One thing I'll definitely do is if you see these controls that are within the object space of the, of the master controller right here, 
what I definitely will do is, um, as I'm walking, I will always zero those. If they're within the object space of the main controller, I always zero it so you don't get gimbal flip um, or uh, having problems with your um, uh, your keys. Because nine times out of ten, actually, no, ninety-nine times out of hundred, in the Euler filter in the graph editor, which is under curves, right here, oil filter, that will fix your curves. Um, but I actually have come up, uh, come across rings and animation that I've been doing that um, a flip happened and uh, oil filter not only didn't help it, but actually made it worse. Like, oh God! So I had to like, manually find the, the right poses that would run. You know, negative 180 this way, positive 360 that way, it was, it was a huge thing. Um, so I definitely recommend, definitely recommend um, uh, zeroing all the controls that you, you, you can. Um, that's actually a tip I forgot to tell you guys, plug, plug the book. Um, How to Cheat in Mario 2012 was just announced by uh, Pope Press. Um, and uh, I was a uh, co-author on this uh, edition of the book with uh, Eric Luta, who wrote the last one. And uh, there's a lot of uh, great new tips and updates for the new tools that are in Maya right now. And um, he has, you know, he, he basically wrote the book uh, on uh, how to avoid gimbal locking in uh, How to Cheat 2010, and he updated it for the uh, current version. And um, you should check it out. Um, you can either look on Amazon for How to Cheat in Maya 2012, or go to Fulton Press, um, I think it's .uk, um, and uh, check it out. But I highly recommend the book, not just because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, whenever, whenever I'm setting a keyframe on something that is like um, kind of iffy, especially the see how the road X is locked and hidden. Like if you start to like move around, I like, see how it's like not actually behaving like kind of according to what I'm doing. That's going to be a super problem control when you. Never start an animation without thoroughly knowing the way to talk the box. But when you're doing your rig testing, you should just look out for those problem controls. And certainly in an IK stretchy spine, I always root zero on, on every single thing. Is that to like avoid like counter rotation jump? Like, you know, when you go from one pose to another, there's like sort of pops if you like. Yeah, normally, normally that's an Euler flip, which is um, basically the math behind it is okay, so you have a, get an object like this, right? <clears throat> and you have your three axes. X, Y, and Z, and um, if I wanted this to be, let's actually put something like a rainbow on it so you can tell, okay. If I wanted this to look like this, I could either rotate it 180 degrees in Y, or I could rotate it 180 degrees in X, and then 180 degrees in Z. See that? So that's what happens when you're posing in the panel. You'll be rotating it around, and Maya has live solvers. So Maya, when, you, when you're rotating it, it actually does something pretty interesting. It act, behind the scenes, it actually um, creates a temporary local space um, transform node, and then it copies it back onto world space whenever you're rotating in the panel. So when you, when you let go, basically, <laughs> It'll say, okay, it started here, and then ended here. Which way did he go? I don't know. It's not recording which way you rotate. So most of the time, it gets it gets right, and it'll just do 180 like that. Every once in a while, it'll go, oh, he probably went like this and went like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, another way to avoid that is to only rotate one axis at a time. But who has time for that? Really? So. Um, anyway, so I'm just gonna round out this pose. Should probably be. You know. When you put your breakdown keys, uh, do you do, build any overlap in that? I love to. Who said that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, because because mostly. Um, um, this is, um, oh, I forgot to plug my website, um, candyroar.com. Anyone heard of candyroar.com? Yeah, you mentioned it earlier. Said it first yeah. What? You said it when you first started. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually have a lot of lectures like this one on candyroar.com that you can go check out. 
And at the end of this lecture, I should have told you this so that no one would leave, but I don't think anyone's left yet. Um, I'm going to give you all the promo codes so you can get a free month on the site. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're already a member, if you're already a member, um, come see me if you're already a member, and I'll, I'll add 30 days to your Okay, so this question? Is there a question? Oh yeah, uh, well, okay, so the reason you want to put your um, like overlap and whatever in your blocking is because the fundamentals are not what you should be like, okay, I have this wonderful animation and now I'm gonna like, you know, make it overlap. You know, sprinkle in the fundamentals. The fundamentals, your 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 scene should always be a combination of fundamentals. It should it should rely on you adding them later. So if you if you can get fundamentals like in your breakdown, you have key here, key here, your breakdown. If you get just a little bit of overlap, then you know as you move forward with the animation that you have basically what I like to call like a knob. Like you imagine like a, a mixer, like an audio mixer with all these little knobs on it. You you built in a knob in your scene that's like, eh, that's not really working. You don't have to put something in there that's not there. You can just adjust, you know, here and there. And um, you can learn all about that in the workflow lecture available on Google.com. <laughs> Actually, uh, my, my father knew a guy, uh, his best friend was a radio DJ, and he taught me to, to say one thing. Um, in, in a radio voice, and it was a, uh, an advertisement for a watch. And he was a radio DJ in uh, Boston. So it was, Welcome back to WKRZ. This section is brought to you by the amazing multi-card. So if you have to watch the digital feature, you can buy it. Why does it amaze your mama? <laughs> I'm working hard here, guys. <laughs> The most common is available on Kmart.com. This is more of a little generic, but I've never seen anyone zero out yeah. the, the, the key. Ever. I, and I, was, I even attended an animation mention. Oh, who's your under? I'm just kidding. You have to go. It's kind of a, you know what? It, it creates a little bit more work because, like, if you're like, Whoa, like right here, then like, it's, oh, it's so easy to just you know push it a little bit and then like rebuild. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this: I'm planning on having him like freak out and be running this way on the treadmill. So whenever, you, especially when you do a like 180 degree turn, you want to make sure that you're not going to go back and like break something with an oil filter. The, 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 you know, in fact, it's great now, but this might actually be a little bit of a, uh, an artifact of my workflow from previous versions of Maya, because the oil filter used to crash Maya like, all the way up to like 2008. So, um, yeah, I, I just recommend it because I haven't run into oil clip in the spine since I've done it ever. How does it actually allow me to do it? It's basically what I'm doing. Who, how is who allowing me to do it? I mean, like, so you zero out the control. How is it even allowing you to, you know, once you key the frame, if you three degrees out on control, usually. Oh, no, I'm not freezing transformations. I'm just putting zero into all of the channels. Uh, I'll talk about it. No, no, I'll show you. This is a world space mover. This is in world space. So if I zero this, it'll snap back to where it was, right? But these, I said these are in this, this, this is the a root control. See how it moves all of these around? These are within this object's object space, meaning that it is, they are childs, children, trials. Come on. <laughs> yeah, so they'll go back to their main position. Okay, cool. So here we go. I have my two poses. <laughs> right? and so super easy to see how this could be timed like magic, right? So let me just load up the layout um, that I did. This is actually the, the layout I did. All of these scenes, sometimes, you know, you'll get other schools, like, you know, people showing you scenes and they just like delete keys and show you their layout. This is real layout, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This is for real. Okay. All right. So here he is. 
pretty much the same pose I just, you know, worked out. Here we go. <laughs> okay? So, at this point, let's go back to um, seeing where we are. Alright, now we move on to on blocking. Fundamental approach is exactly what you were asking, um, which is that the fundamentals are what I'm thinking of, are, are the front of my mind right now when I'm working on the animation. I don't want anything to uh, creep in to the animation that can't be tweaked or adjusted, right? So I'm going to make sure that all of my breakdowns, if it they, if they can be like overlap on, on one thing, I'm going to at least touch it, at least tweak it, so there's something that I'm going to adjust later. Um, I'm going to keep it step keys while I'm walking. Um, all the way up until I, uh, I spline it right at the end of blocking, and then we're in blocking plus, or what's called a studio's only temp animation. Um, and you'll notice that my keyframe economy and inability is super high. I could probably retime this entire thing in the dope sheet still because all the keys are on the same frame. Keep on comparing my thumbs. Okay, normally I'll have my thumbs, you know, printed out. I do a lot of thumbnails on, on paper. I just happen to do these in sketchbook. Um, but keep on comparing what I'm getting, okay? And then um, now it's time to add that performance texture. That's the you know contrasting the quick and the slow, the big and the small, where it has to do with the performance I've chosen. So for instance, um, I want his arms to be reaching out as he's on the treadmill, like he's grabbing for something. And so I'll probably put in just the keys that I'll need to adjust later for that reaching kind of moment, okay? So, um, Oops. Um, so let's go. Uh, let's go back to here and uh, let's start adding some breakdowns. I don't want to. I don't want to only work on the beginning because that'll be boring to watch. So let's, let's add some right here. And if you have any more questions, you can just yell them out. Is it easier to work with? Ladies first. Is it easier to work with a pen tab when you're animating? Um, if I didn't have a pen, if they, if Wacom didn't invent this gorgeous device, I would be sitting in front of you right now. <laughs> um, because uh, my wrist started stinging like two years ago. I actually know a lot of people that um, have blown their wrists, and um, then they went to a foot mouse, and two of them blew their feet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What? I know. Now they have ankle problems. <laughs> and now they have a head mouse. I'm like, dude, don't blow your head. <laughs> Have you ever used a 3D mouse? I did. I um I tried the uh, Space Pilot Pro from yes. 3D Connection. Yes. Um, is that what you have? I don't have it yet, but that's one thing you're getting at. Okay. Um, I wouldn't recommend it just yet. I had tried the new driver, but the old driver didn't work with complex characters. Oh, okay. Because of the, the thing that I said a second ago, which is that Maya actually copies basically into this this local transform space while you're editing it. This is why I'll show you why I'll prove it to you. <laughs> so, here's my um, graph editor, right? See how when I move it up, nothing happens? And I let go, it set the key right there. You all see that? That's because it is actually transforming and then copies the tree, copies the transform, trickles down the transform matrix until it finds where it needs to be and then copies it. It's almost the same as parent constraining it to an animated mode and baking that channel for each frame. So what the three connection does is um, it doesn't it doesn't do that calculation um, correctly when you're when you're moving it around. I, I, it's shaped like this, and, and right. you try to move it around. And well, I knew they were working out bugs still, but I thought they were past that point. Uh, I had it last year. Okay, so one thing I want to get in, like like I just said, is I wanted to definitely get in his arms like reaching. So let's let's key that in. Okay. And also, in terms of texture, what we have going on underneath his feet right here is going to be very, very fast. I want it to be a really gazelle feeling kind of thing, where he's, you know, you know, like really hanging on the top. And so I know a lot of fast motion is going to happen underneath, and this is when I'm planning, I'm thinking ahead. So on the top, on his, on his torso and upwards, I want it to be nice and even and smooth. So I have this crazy stuff, but on the top, I basically have them leaning back to leaning forward. And in the final version of my animation, 
right? What I want you to be able to see is how I planned ahead that contrast of this movement with his feet with this nice, even, backwards to forwards motion. Because you have to have that rhythm and that, and that, that contrast in the, in the timing, or it's just going to look not, not, not going to look very fun. How do you get that sort of motion uh, where you have two contradictory motions, like you have a slow, like, like you just said, the body's moving slow and the feet are moving fast. I've tried to do that like so many times I can't get it. Like, um, for example, I've seen a run cycle where the guy, the, you know, the hips are going up and down like the, uh, like the bouncing ball and the, and the arms are moving like as if they were like, like a flag or something. It's just really, really weighty. Mm -hmm. uh, two, it's just two different type of motions, but they look really... Awesome. <laughs> um, for that, I would say uh, I would need to see it kind of like on a case by case basis how they got it. Yeah. Um, but in general, all you have to really do is um, kind of start to cover up what you're not looking at and, and just make sure you're getting the, the right impression for that section of the body. You can get a little bit of disjointed feeling from that though. And you need to be careful. There still needs to be good body mechanics. So if the arms are waving like frantically, and but there's no kind of like a little bit of you know secondary motion, not secondary action, it's completely the thing, but secondary motion in the in the torso, then it's going to look a little bit weird. Um, I asked my friend, a guy named uh, um, this is my really good friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know it's my brother. Uh, <laughs> Robbie, 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 God, I, oh, Robbie. <laughs> um, what um, his his favorite textural scene was, and he animated the part of robots where Big Well is going down the um, the they, he's just been like doped up and like ejected <laughs> from the uh, factory, and he's going down that little slide. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it, and I watched this super textural experience, that whole shot, because he's basically going like left and right is like the drunkenness, like Whoa. And his arms are like a roller coaster, like Wee! And then his body, because it, it shouldn't feel like perfectly smooth glass, they want it to be like metal on metal, like a little bit of vibration. The body has that in there. And he was actually able to get a little bit of like when he was a big hit you know, it back into the head. And um, two, two things, animation layers have come a long way in Maya, and I definitely suggest, you know, at least looking into them, um, now that, uh, you know, now, now they're pretty darn good. But um, um, definitely leave that, that's non-performance texture. Leave that until the end. Because you're gonna screw up everything you're, you're animating um, if you put that in um, too early. I tried to build that in, like I said, with the overlap, you know, into the overlap, and it just wasn't working. You know what I mean? It yeah. Just, yeah, yeah that, that you, you did too early. Yeah. Alright, so see here, um, his arm, I decided this, that this step key is his arm moving up, so if his arm is moving up, I'm going to key this down like it's overlapping. Right? And I'm going to key this one upwards. Let's actually go back. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. Just this one little part, and turn the sound up again. Can you hear when I play the, the sound? Yeah. 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 Okay, so see that just little texture that's in there already? Okay, it's going to be fantastic. And I, I'm already seeing that, hey, great, the overall body motion pretty even backwards to forwards. Okay? Okay, so that's how I started adding those breakdowns into this shot. Okay, let's see what it looks like when I had all those breakdowns in and I have um, blocked it up. How much detail do you usually put into um, animating while you're stuck? You um, you'll see right now. <coughs> Why can't you just be patient? Be <laughs> excited. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to select all these controls, and here is the graph editor. So as you can see, mostly full body, mostly all the controls have keys on the same frame, and it looks like the most detailed sections, this is on ones, 
But here's here's uh, three frames. Uh, this is four. How do you scale that correctly? Alt and um, Control. right mouse button, and then Alt Shift is this way if you scroll left and right, and Alt Shift this way is up and down. Alt Shift right mouse button. Okay. I'm always trying to get into that part where I'm zooming in on those, just those one particular key frame. Yeah. Or you can select them and hit that. Right. right. Yeah. Sometimes you just like, keep scrolling back to yeah. the full. One thing is that um, you, when you're looking at um, translate Y keys, especially, because translate Y is supposed to look like a bouncing ball, you're always doing bouncing ball, right? So it should be a nice parabolic arc. A lot of times, if you're translate Y, if a person like, fell off a building and then bounced, that translate Y will be so stretched that when you frame it, right. it'll be this little flat, crappy thing. Mm -hmm. And you'll want to be using a lot of um, uh, scaling like this right. to try to get it back to where it's supposed to look right now. Um, it's all shit, right mouse button? Yeah. Sometimes I forget, because it's so it's so instinctual for me now. Like, when I start thinking about what it is, like, you saw I pause, like, it's all shit, right? Yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll be sitting here like, how do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll actually hit F1 sometimes. Okay. So you'll see here that we have basically a very, very, um, you know, all keys pretty much posed again on the same um, frame. And this is the blocking pass of this animation. And I pick the camera by this point. Here's my camera. Okay. And um, here we go. Okay? So let's, th this is always the worst part. You have to hold your nose and select everything and go to spawn. And it's so painful every time. <laughs> the only thing you can do to save yourself from this being super painful is block fundamentally and know exactly what the curves are supposed to look like before you even spline them. Like what should a plateaued, like gazelle kind of Y curve look like? I, I, I blew it, I said plateau, right? So it should be really fast in and out of that impact pose and very flat at the top. So I'm gonna select all of these, or you don't actually select them, you can just click spline. <laughs> now, now, come on. All right, and now I'm going to select just the root control uh, translate Y. Of course, it helps if I'm talking about the right thing. Okay, here it is. So here's where he's running. I'm afraid of plateau. Right? So what I'm going to do is, because I know exactly what I want it to look like, before I even watch it, with the most important parts, I'm normally going to change it. Okay? Actually, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to let you watch it and see how much impact is lost. Okay? And I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> okay. Alright. <laughs> All right, so this is the true test. Like, oh, this is an animation show, yeah. Okay, so now I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to make these what they should look like. I do a lot of deleting when I'm uh, going to tech animation, a lot. Um, and you should not be afraid to delete. Um, do you use a buffer curve? I do a lot when it has to do with something where I'm uh, trying and experimenting. Um, buffer curves, anyone not know what buffer curves are? Okay, this is what buffer curves are. Um, Actually, my stupid window is in big enough to show. I'm going to drag this off. Oh man, I think I have to tear off. Oh no, there they are. <coughs> All right. Buffer curves are these right here. First thing you need to do is go view, show buffer curves. All right? What they are is basically an infinite undo on your animation curves. They're amazing. Let's say you want to try something out and uh, you don't know how it's going to look. What you do is you select your curve, you hit this, which snaps a new buffer curve to your curve. If you move it away, you see there's a little gray thing. All right. Let's say that I was going off and then I started modeling in the scene. And I grab, you know, grab this and you know, uh, go to face and you know, extrude it out, you know, this way. And then oh, I'm starting to 
playing around with the spider or whatever I'm doing, right? I would have to, I wanted to fix that animation and go undo, 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 and fix everything that I had just done, right? With buffer curves, all you have to do, oops, I'm still running. There we go. With buffer curves, all you have to do is hit this button, which snaps your curve back to the buffer curve. And leaves a new buffer curve where you just left it. And buffer curves save into your scene. So I've actually had a, my supervisor come by and say, like, which do you like better? This? Ah, boom, 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 boom. And then, or this? Boop, snap it, and then and show the animation. So, and it is it lasts for infinity until you snap a new one. So um, if you're undo buffer, sometimes you know an undo buffer can't you know go back down you know to the, the original root. It like you know gets cut cut off a branch. With this, you can actually go wild with your animation. Which I I if I can give you if you take one thing from this is that you have to be crazy with your animation. You have to go wild. Okay, I have this um, animation. Uh, the mentor that I told you about, Jen, who told me that if you only go, if you never break it, you'll never know how far you're supposed to be. Or her mentor would put it this way: um, push your animation twice as far as you think it possibly should ever go. You're probably about halfway there. Okay, so um, the way this works in production is, if let's say that this is the amount of push, whatever, broad breadth of gesture, speed of motion, size of the pose, strength of the silhouette, whatever, and you start right here. We all start right. Right? And you just push it and push it and push it and push it every single week. Your director's going to be sick and tired of you. They're going to say, like, oh, why isn't this not there yet? Oh, I told you to push this. It's just not working. Try it and try it and try again. However, if you break it, we love to see that. Why? Because now we know exactly where we need to split the difference. You've shown us how far is too far. And now we have, we actually have graduated scale. Okay, so you can get there in exponentially fewer iterations if you go way too far. So if you take one thing from this, is that you should always break your animation at least once when you're working on it. I'm not kidding. You should look at your animation and at, at least once while you're working on it and say, that is broken. That is bad. Okay, so I'm going to make all my um, curves um, weighted. So that I can do that nice plateau. I want to do everything with tangents that I that I possibly can. I don't want to set more keys, of course. So I'm just going to make these two plateaued. Weighted. Mm -hmm. Definitely weighted. What's like the big difference? Uh, the big difference is I can actually pull these tangent handles and it'll stretch the value of the weight of that that key frame. Right, and so really, really strong fast in and out of that, that impact pose. And I know that this is a problem, that all of these Ys are at a different spot right now, but my body is more important than my legs. So when my body is looking good, I can make the legs work, look good um, underneath it and, and, and work in the body. So I'm actually just going to leave these keys how they are and, and now watch the Y curve in the uh, freaked out part and see if it has any more impact. And you can let me know when you see this if it looks um, a little bit better than it did before I did this. A little bit better, but I need to be even taller. I didn't even need you to tell me. Did you work by the rule of thumb that you make sure that you take change of angles from surpassing the next key? Um, so you don't get it once you kind of lift some integration? Uh, yes, but um, only only so much so that the, I mean, this, this is what I want. I want to fast out right here. You, you, you get that, you know, that crazy popping. Oh, look at that. Maya 2012 actually dials you back. Like, no, you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, much better. See how he's, he's, he's popping out? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so now we go to blocking plus. So when we turn it into, I normally turn my move holds into copy pairs, which are splines. I fall back on the fundamentals. When I don't know what to do, I look at those fundamentals that I built in at the blocking stage and I adjust those. I'm like, eh, it's not looking good. Why is this like bouncing ball and not looking good? Oh, probably because I don't have enough slow in slot of that top pose or something. 
Walking with Bless is where you start working on your arcs and keeping your arcs nice and, 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 and beautiful and, and, and really flowing. Um, arcs are super, super key. Uh, when you're working on your computer monitor at home, it's hard to imagine how, how big the, uh, the arcs are going to end up on a, a screen that's 50 feet wide. Um, but you'll actually be dialed down um, by your animation supervisor on a feature film. Um, uh, it, because it's so big on screen, something that is just like, you know, like a little bit of a head movement or like you can watch with your eyes, is like this, you know, for an audience in the theater. Um, with this shot, I started ranging my feet with the hips, and that got a nice little play between my pelvis and my hips on each step. I wanted my, my root controller to be like a bouncing gazelle, and I found that there was a couple of footfalls that just weren't working, so I used that, I used my hips to range the feet. I continued to compare thumbs, watching at speed, and making a list for notes. Now this is my list um, that I made for notes. And if you're not doing this, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. Um, this is another must do, okay? Um, this is just notepad, okay? I do a frame number in bra brackets and then the note, okay? So, um, at the end of Blocking Plus, let me load it up. What is it? Yeah. yeah. You'll kind of come up with a vernacular as you're, as you're working as well. <laughs> All right, I changed the color because I couldn't see his uh, shorts against the, the back. Um, and so here was the notes that I actually had for this piece of animation. Okay, how cool is it that he's trying to get away from this thing he's terrified and he's on a treadmill? I think it's the dopest thing in the world. Okay, but anyway, but here was my my notes. Shoulder shape unattractive, frame 115. Okay? Uh, frame 42, screen right arm needs new arc. Yeah, see how it's coming and boop, hitting a wall and then reaching forward? Okay? 9110, smooth out the arc in the chest. As he's winding up, look how it like, kind of like wiggles and, and it's all nasty. All right? So the reason you have to make a list of notes when you're watching animation, do it every single time you sit down at your animation, you haven't seen it for a long time. Why? Because this is your eye when it's fresh and you can see the problems in the animation. If you just look at your animation, load it up, like, oh, what am I work on now? Oh, that looks bad, and you work on it, you're going to be wearing down your eye and losing it and losing it and losing it. And then when it comes time to work on the second thing, you're already mishmush in your eyes. This way, you're gifting yourself in the future a list of notes that was from somebody who had a fresh eye with the animation. You have to make lists of notes. Cannot do it any other way than expect to uh, you know, get anything done. Um, let's see what else. 51, we're 51, make the body a little bit lower. Yeah, I can see that as he's running by. And then, now you can see why I was actually happy that the legs didn't stretch. I mean, how much funnier is it that these tiny little, tiny little things are... And I love this moment, too, where he goes, wing, and then they both shoot out and kind of, like, lift up like that. It's so much fun. <laughs> okay, so then, after I put all those notes in, this was the, um, the polish pass that I did. Following this workflow, I was able to get this done, the shot done in uh, two and a half days. Which is um, which is a good clip. That's like a um, that's a good uh, commercial commercial uh, speed. Commercials were like ten seconds a week, so two and a half days for five seconds. Ago. All right, here we go. <laughs> Um, some few things to notice. Let's let's check out these frames that I uh, picked out as, as problem frames, like chatter in the chest, um, 90 to 100. So it's a nice smooth arc now. Okay, and the way I did that, which you all are going to love, is the editable motion trails. Oh, these are these are this, this is the <laughs> potatoes right here, guys. 
Is that the 2012 thing? Is that 2012? It was 2012. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Nuggets for that. So check it out. So I was like, huh, this is, this is you know, whatever. You get to move. This is actually moving to the what? And no. You're like, you're not so great. <laughs> What's that? Um, animate, create editable motion trails. And now all of these keys are editable. So if I, what is that, frame 95? I go to frame 95, see? Isn't that sweet? 2011 doesn't have that. There's plugins for it, though. I have a question. Yeah. Is the edible motion curve more stable compared to 2011? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Quite a bit. Absolutely. Sweet. Hey guys, uh, so Kenny should be wrapping up in about the next seven to ten minutes. No! No! no. <laughs> Why? Get out of here. <laughs> Why you show up now? Why is this late? No. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Just two more hours. <laughs> so, uh, um, what's going to happen is, uh, as soon as you guys are done here, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing the closing remarks at Hall A at the main auditorium. So uh, hopefully I'll see some of you guys over there. All right. <laughs> We're all going to come. We're all going. <laughs> if, I don't if they follow you, they will. I'm going. <laughs> all right. Hey, man. Hey, man. There you go, man. Sweet. Uh, I'm not sure if 2011 has this as well. But uh -oh, uh -oh. but um, if you select a, a key on the motion curve, you can show the in and out um, influence. So you can actually select it and drag it so that it can change the influence of the curve. So this is like dragging your tangent um, in a graph editor. So you can actually make all those graph editor adjustments um, right in the panel. trail. So let me grab a uh, frame one. Yeah. <laughs> So, but that's how I um, fixed <coughs> fixed my um, curve problems. Um, I addressed all the notes uh, that I saw. And um, this would probably um, pass at a uh, TV or a uh, commercial VFX um, studio as final animation. Um, at a feature house like uh, DreamWorks of Disney or Pixar, probably need one more public pass on it. Um, and I would make a, make a list of that. Um, but uh, one more time, actually I have the render somewhere here. So you see that that motion blur a little bit. How do you do a motion blur? What's that? How do you do a motion blur? Uh, that was just a mental way of motion blur. At my studio, we normally render motion vectors and use a uh, a tuning plugin for that. Okay. Um, and then polish. Remember, polish is a totally new mindset of your animation. It's not just extending your blocking across. It is making those lists of notes and making sure by revisiting those questions of the impact and the engagement of your performance and making sure that everything is exactly where you want it to be. Polish is where you put in that non-performance section that you were asking about. Like, you know, Big Will rolling and vibrating down that long that long tube. Arcs, I uh, fixed those arcs in those really complex areas 
and, and imagine at the end of your shot, you're going to have like that pelvis counter-animated against the chest and whatever, it's going to move, and you're going to have a lot of you know, counter-animated um, uh, controls that are going to be way too hard to go all the way back and just perfectly smooth out. Totally fine when you're doing a super final, super final polish to do motion trails and fix it on once. Remember not to polish too early, and then you get final 5%, like toast, blades, wings, and you'll notice I did a little bit of facial animation. Like squints and then rah, like when you get scared and stuff like that. Let's re review the basics really quick. Cartooning is not just push fundamentals. Okay, you need to create the impression of emotion that you want to give your your viewer and engage them. Really pull them in. Flash something in front of their eyes. It's going to make them feel like they saw it ten times more than they possibly could with just the pose of the character. Experiment with 3D. Now that you know what buffer curves are, you have no excuse not to break your animation at least once. Watch lots of animation now and try to find those visual similes that the animators chose to give that in. Okay? And base it in reality. It's not just push unrealistic animation. That's not cartoony. It's based in reality. That arrow stick is like a perfectly animated arrow stick. Right? With great fundamentals. <clears throat> And most importantly, have fun. <laughs> All right, and we just went over this. Intermediate cartoonies, you've already seen this. And I hope that it all sunk in and that you are going to not stop with your first idea of your cartoony, your visual impression, and you're really going to push yourself <coughs> to, make it, uh, to make it work, okay? Um, that is it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh,